Sunrise and sunset. Promise and fulfillment. Birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. The wheels of chance, like the hands of time, move slowly. But time is more dependable. Chance is not only a gambler and a knave, it's also a playwright. And like the egotistical creature it is, it plays all the parts, including the hero and the villain. Tonight I'd like to tell you of one of its masterpieces, which Chance co-authored with its very good friend, Coincidence. <laughs> a fine pair, Chance and Coincidence. And a lusty match for anyone. Well, the place, Somerville, a drowsy little town with a population of 2,704, including Mrs. Wilson's twins, which were born last week. Somerville's vital statistics are recorded in the town hall... And if you look up the figures on crime, you'll find that Somerville is a very law-abiding place. The last outbreak of violence occurred on June 4th, 1943, when two young boys swiped three or four potatoes from the bin in front of Mr. Gorsey's general food store. The punishment was swift and just, and was meted out by the culprit's parents. The principal character in our story is a man named Howard Williams, a recent arrival in Somerville. He has a wife and two children, a boy and a girl, and two occupations, accounting and minding his own business. The time? Well, the time is now. Oh, good evening, Mr. Williams. Good evening, Mr. Hawley. I, I took two of your papers from the stand outside, the Star and the Gazette. Oh, that's eight cents. Uh, anything else? Not just now, thank you. Good. I understand you got yourself fixed up at the cottage on Spring Street. Eh? Yes, I was quite a break. Houses aren't easy to rent these days. Uh, I take it then that you'll be staying in Somerville for a while. Hmm? I'm going to make it my home, Mr. Holly. Oh, now, that's fine. That's real fine. You'll find the folks hereabouts are plain, not very exciting, but they're nice people to know. I think we're going to like it here. I'm sure you will. Uh, you, you like detective stories? Not particularly, but, but my wife does. Oh, fine. Well, now, look, I got a new issue in today. I thought you might like a copy. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice for reading by the fire and scaring the tar out of you in a long winter's night. I'll buy a copy for Hazel. <laughs> she gets a big kick out of stuff like that. Oh, good. Here you are, Mr. Williams. That's uh, 23 cents and all. Uh -huh. Thank you. Hey, this, this first story sounds like a thriller. There's a crime that was almost perfect. <laughs> oh, Hazel should like that. She's always getting me into arguments about the perfect crime. She, yeah. she reads so much of this stuff, she believes the perfect crime is impossible. Impossible? Well, well uh, don't you? Oh, it seems to me there's many an unsolved murder case in the police files. Of course, I, I don't know much about those things, but I imagine a man could kill another man and get away with it if he planned it carefully enough. Ah, yes, but there's always a slip-up, isn't there? Well, maybe there is. I, I couldn't say. No, my business is accounting. I prefer leaving the criminology to someone else. <laughs> it's a good idea. I want a pack of cigarettes, Kensington. Very good. Here you are, ma'am. Uh, do you know where I can get a room for the night? Uh, Somerville Hotel is just about three blocks up. No, I tried that. I phoned. They don't have anything. Uh, well, the only other place I know of is Mrs. Cop's room and house. Where's that? It's just outside the town, about, about two miles up. Is there a bus that goes in that direction? Well, yes, you can catch it right in front of the door. Oh, good. Thanks very much. Oh, don't mention it. A stranger in town, I guess. Mighty pretty, too, eh? Well, I, I think I'll be on my way, Mr. Holly. I'm afraid I'm late for dinner. Well, I'm certainly glad to hear you're going to make Somerville your home, Mr. Williams. We're one big happy family in this town, and we always welcome you, come on. Well, it's good to have friends, Mr. Holly. Lots of friends, and I hope to make them here. I, I'm a simple man with simple tastes, and I've always wanted to raise my family in a community like this. Drop in again soon, Mr. Williams. I will, and, and thanks. Good night. Well, the weather's awful, isn't it? Uh, you know, it looks like we're in for a storm. It's beginning to hail. How often do those buses run past? I'm not sure. Every 15 minutes, I imagine. Maybe I can get a cab. I'm going in your direction. You are? And I have a car over there. Can I give you a lift? Well, I'd hate to put you to any trouble. No trouble at all. Um, maybe you'd better not. Why? Oh, well... Oh, well, I guess it's all right. Which car did you say was yours? Uh, the gray sedan. Oh, let's go. Do you mind if 
I stop at this gas station for a minute? My tank's a little low. No, it's all right with me. I'll fill her up, mister? Yes, please. And uh, check the oil. Uh, do you have a phone inside? Oh, yes, ma'am. I'll be right back. No hurry. Eh, rat night, ain't it, mister? Blowing up. Mm. Better watch the road out of town. This hail ain't gonna do it much good. Mm, well, I'm not going very far. Say, your left front tire's kind of smooth. Uh, you better get a change. I intend to buy a whole new set next week. Oh, can I take your order for it? I suppose you can. Uh, my name is Williams. I'll I'll run by here on Wednesday or Thursday and let's put them on. Okay. Say, you're new in town, ain't you, mister? Uh, we've just been here a little over a week. Well, welcome to Somerville. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. My name's Pete. Uh, I, I run this gas station. Anytime you need any advice about your bus, just drop in. <laughs> no charge for advice to neighbors. That's very kind of you. Yep. We're small town, maybe, but we get along nicely. City's a good place to visit, but it's no place to live. Ah, eh, you never get to know folks the way you do here in Somerville. And they seem like worthwhile people to know. <laughs> well, I'll check your battery and your water. You ready? Just about. Look, I changed my mind. I'm not going to that rooming house just yet. Do you know where the turnpike is? It's a mile from here. But it's only a crossroads. Are you driving past? Yes. Yeah. Then I'll get off there. But there's nothing up the turnpike. Well, Are I... you giving me a lift or aren't you? Why, of course. Then let's get going, and you can drop me off where I asked you to. At the turn. You certainly are a careful driver, mister. It's hard to see the road in this weather. How far are we from the turnpike now? Uh, half a mile, I guess. I'll let... Uh... Well, what's the matter? I'm almost afraid to look. Just a second. I thought so. What is it? Blowout. Oh, for heaven's sake. I'm sorry. I don't like it any more than you do. It won't do my clothes any good to get down in this mud on my hands and knees, but it looks as if I'm elected. Well, I'm leaving. Well... There's nothing I can do to help, and I'm in a hurry. The turnpike's up ahead, isn't it? Well, just keep walking. You can't miss it. If you wait a few minutes, though, I'll change this tire. No, I can't wait. Thanks, Phyllis. We'll be seeing you. Be careful. The road's very slippery. Well, I better get started. Looks like I'll be home a good deal later than I thought. Hold it, mister! Hold it! What's the trouble? The road is blocked. There's been a crack up. You'll have to detour. Uh, which way do I go? I live on Spring Street. Well, you better turn back and make a left turn on Maple. Oh, apparently I'll never get home. Sorry, mister. Well, <laughs> nice night for ducks, anyway. Yeah, huh? ducks and murder. Uh, Maple, did you say? That's right, mister, and uh, take it easy. Howard Williams, you ought to be spanked. Now, don't be angry with me, Hazel. I couldn't help it. We'll have to send those clothes to the cleaners immediately. I only hope they can get all the mud off. Well, it's nice to be home again in front of the fire. Uh, is that robe warm enough for you, dear? Now, stop worrying, dear. I don't catch colds as easily as that. Howard, I met one of our neighbors this afternoon, Mrs. Harvey. Oh, she was awfully nice. She kept asking me if there was anything she could do to help make us comfortable. Everyone here seems to be that way, Hazel. It's going to be nice living in Somerville. After all we've been through, it'll be like making a brand new life for ourselves. Uh, you promised me you wouldn't think about it. What happened? It was like a bad dream. But I'll forget about it. In time? I, I did all I could for Mr. Cagle. Sorry it ended up the way it did, then, that's all. If only he hadn't dragged you into it. Your reputation. Hazel. Let's not discuss it, huh? Are you happy, Howard? Right now, I'm very happy. There's a great deal more to living than making money, Hazel. When you have peace... Contentment when, when you have good friends and neighbors. Oh, I'll take it there. Hello? Mr. Williams there, please. Who's calling? My name is Mallory. Lieutenant Mallory, State Police. Police? Just a moment. Police? Yes. Hello? Mr. Williams? Yes? Sorry to trouble you, Mr. Williams, but I was wondering if you might give me some information. 
About what? You know a woman named Laura Pearson? Why, no. Are you sure? Uh, quite sure. We didn't think you'd know her, but uh, Mr. Hawley mentioned something about your being in his stationery store when she came in for cigarettes. A tall girl, good-looking, bleached blonde hair. Oh, uh, oh yes, I, I remember now. Good. I wonder if you'd mind dropping into headquarters for a few minutes. Now? Well, if it's not too much trouble, we won't keep you long, but you may be able to help us out. Well, uh, if it's important... Yeah, it's very important. You see, we found Laura Pearson about an hour ago. She'd been strangled to death. <laughs> Yes, the town of Somerville is very small, and you'd never find it on the map. But things do happen in Somerville. On this particular evening, for instance, at exactly 8.45, Howard Williams stepped into Lieutenant Mallory's office at police headquarters and was formally introduced to fear. Sit down, Mr. Williams, sit down. Do you remember Pete, the owner of the gas station? Oh, hello, Pete. Hello. Pete told me you'd met a couple of hours ago. He's the guy, Lieutenant. She was riding with him when he stopped for gas. According to Pete, Mr. Williams, Miss Pearson was seen in your car just before her body was found. I, I could have told you that myself if you'd asked. Naturally, naturally. Uh, how did you come to pick her up, Mr. Williams? I, I didn't pick her up. No? No. I gave her a ride. Oh, but... I'm sorry. Uh, I'm afraid I put it in the wrong terms. Exactly what occurred between you and Miss Pearson this evening, Mr. Williams? Well, I, I met her outside the stationery store mm -hmm. and offered her a lift to Mrs. Carp's. She made a phone call at the gas station. Is that right, Pete? I guess so. Well, of course it's right. Why should I lie to you? Oh, I beg your pardon. I, I didn't mean to infer that you'd lie. Uh, please go on with your story. Uh, well, that's about all there was to it. Instead of going to Mrs. Carp's, she asked me to drop her off at the turnpike. Oh, why? She didn't say why. Mr. Williams, the turnpike is uh, over a mile from Mrs. Carp's. That's an odd place for a young girl to go in weather like this. Well, it wasn't any of my business why she was going there. And, and I didn't ask her. I, I only... Just a minute, please. Flanagan, send Mr. Hawley in. Well, I'm afraid I can't help you out very much in connection with Miss Pearson. I never saw her before tonight, and I... Uh... Oh, come in, uh, Mr. Hawley. Howdy. Good evening, Mr. Hawley. I said good evening. Yes, I heard you. Mr. Hawley, did Mr. Williams and the Pearson woman recognize each other when they met in your store? Well, uh, I can't recollect that they did. All I know is that it... Say, that, that, that's very funny. What is? Weren't you wearing a brown suit about three hours ago, Mr. Williams? Uh, why, yes. Why did you change your clothes? Well, because my other suit. Wait a minute. What is this, Lieutenant Mallory? I, I'm beginning to feel as if you're questioning me like, like a suspect. Oh, no, no not at all. We merely want whatever information you can supply. But I won't question you any more right now, Mr. Williams. Uh, perhaps I'll get in touch with you again tomorrow. Thanks a lot for coming in. That's all right. Oh, just a second. Uh, Mr. Hawley tells me your wife reads detective stories. What about it? He said that you and she were discussing the perfect crime this evening. Perfect crime? <laughs> well, I know how it is, Mr. Williams. I sometimes read detective stories myself. Good night. What happened, Howard? I don't know. He questioned me. Uh, about this girl. And that was all. They certainly don't think that you had anything to do with it. Of course not. I, I saw her before the murder, so naturally they want me to give any information I can. Well, I never even met the girl before. It's ridiculous. They haven't got anything on me. And they can't prove anything. They... Hazel. Yes, dear? You know I had nothing to do with this, don't you? You don't have to defend yourself to me, Howard. Defend myself? What? Yes, that's what I'm doing now, isn't it? Defending myself. It just doesn't make sense. I have nothing to defend myself against, Hazel. Have I? Sorry to disturb you again, Mr. Williams. What is it now, Lieutenant? 
There's a man named Cy Parker who lives about a mile north of the turnpike. I'm afraid I don't know who he is. Well, he may know you, however. He does? I seem to give me a pretty good description of you. He said he warned you away from the roadblock uh, early this evening. Oh, he must have been the man who told me to detour. That's right. He also said you were alone. What about him? That you looked like you'd been through some kind of a crack-up yourself. But I look like a... Well, he said he noticed mud on your face and hands, and you seemed to be rather annoyed at being held up. Well, naturally, the weather was foul, and as far as the mud was concerned... Are those I... your clothes on that chair there? Yeah. Brown suit. Were you wearing it tonight? Yes. It's muddy, isn't it? Well, I, I had to fi fix it a flat tire. Ah. Mr. Williams, you'll have to return to headquarters with me. What for? Well, there are two or three loose ends that have to be cleared up. Loose ends? What do you mean? When we found Laura Pearson's body, uh, her clothes were also covered with mud. Have another beer, Si? Yeah, I don't mind if I do. I never would have figured him for it. Uh, didn't look like that kind of guy to me. You mean you really think he killed that gal? Well, no, I'm not the type who'd pin a man against the wall without proof, and I believe in fair trial by jury. According to law, a man's innocent until he's proven guilty, right? Right. But between you and me, Si, who else could have done it? And I saw the way he looked at her when she came into my store, I tell you. I don't care if he never seen her before. I know what goes on in a man's mind when he sees a girl like that. Well, he's got a wife and two kids besides. Say, you think maybe he's crazy, Holly? Crazy? Uh, crazy? Uh, look, a lunatic don't plan a killing the way he planned this one. Look at how slick he did it. Oh, no. Oh, he ain't no crazier than I am, a murdering rat. Uh, well, Judge, uh, he was sitting with this woman in the car, and it seemed to me they knew each other a lot longer than he said he did. Uh, anyway, uh, he told me to fill up his tank and... I figured uh, he was going for a ride, a, a long ride, with her. He was as nervous as a cat, Judge, and dirty in a mongrel, too. He kind of stared at me when I mentioned something about the weather and that it was a nice night for murder. He talked like he knew a lot about crime, Judge. <laughs> now, we, we had this argument about the story, see, and he said to me, uh, no, wait till I get the words right. He said, uh, I imagine a man could kill another man and get away with it, if he planned it carefully enough. When the body was examined, the coroner concluded that she'd only been dead for half an hour. He, uh, filled his gas tank at 7.10. Cy Parker steered him away from that roadblock at 7.40. That's only a ten-minute drive from the gas station to the roadblock at the most, but apparently it took Williams almost 40 minutes. We uh, also discovered that the defendant had been involved in an embezzlement case in Chicago. He was acquitted. He left the city soon after. Added as the judgment of this court, Howard Williams, that you be sentenced to hang by the neck until you are dead. Well, I haven't been very kind to poor Howard Williams so far, have I? But let's see what I have in store for him as his wife visits him in the cell. Howard. Hello, Hazel. Howard, they... They just told me... There'd be no reprieve. I know. They told me an hour ago. Howard, what are we going to do? What can we do? They can't kill an innocent man. I don't believe it. They couldn't. You're the only one who believes I'm innocent, Hazel. Oh, why did we come here? Why did we ever come to this horrible place? <laughs> don't. All the kids. They, they asked you. <laughs> Hazel, I want you to leave now. Please? It'll make it easier for both of us. Well, will this be the last time I'll be able to see you? Yes. Oh. No, don't, don't say any more. Tell them outside that I want to see the prison chaplain. I refused to talk to him earlier. But I've changed my mind. Goodbye, Hazel. No. No, I won't say goodbye. You still have time. There's still a chance. There's still a chance. And the 
afraid there isn't, Mr. Williams. Hello, Lieutenant. Hello, Williams. You asked to see me? Yes. Open the cell door, Haggerty. You can leave us, Haggerty. Hazel, will you leave us, too? Well, I'll wait outside. Very tough on her. Yeah, even tougher than it is on me. I'm sorry, William. Mallory, I have a favor to ask you. Yeah, what is it? One day, Mallory, you'll find that I was innocent. Will I? You're a good detective. One of the best in the state. Something will turn up. Something that will make you think. And reopen this case. Perhaps. All I ask is that when you do hit on new evidence, you'll prove me innocent. It won't do me any good, I know. But, but at least my name will be cleared. And, and my family will be happier. I see. I know it's a lot to ask, but... I swear to you that I... I didn't murder that woman. I'm going to die in a couple of hours, and I wouldn't lie at a time like this. You've got to believe me, Mallory. I'm not guilty. I believe you, William. You know? I not only believe you, but I'm sure you're telling the truth. You're sure? Did you, did you say? Yeah. But how can, how can you be sure? I, I mean... It's very simple. Very simple? Uh-huh. I know you're innocent because I also know who killed Laura Pearson. Then why didn't you tell him? Why in the name of heaven? Don't you tell him that you, you know? I can't, William. You see, I killed her myself. What? Yeah, I was the one who called. She, she called that night from the gas station. I was the one she met, Williams, at the turnpike. No. She deserved to die. She was a blackmailer, a cheat. She wouldn't take no for an answer when I told her we were through. I have a family of my own to think about. You'd tell me that now? You wouldn't expect me to mention it in the courtroom, would you? Yeah, I killed Laura Pearson. There are only two people who know about it now, Williams. And after tonight, there'll only be one. You're wrong, Mallory. Wrong? There's someone else you didn't count on me. He's just outside the cell door. What? Did you hear what he said, Chaplain? Did you hear? Yes, I heard. Chaplain, as a man of God, you've got to keep a confidence. You can't tell them. You won't. No, Lieutenant. I won't. But you will, my son. Yeah, you're right, Chaplain. I guess I will. And that is the story of Howard Williams as recorded by the clock. Chance and coincidence. Collaborators extraordinary. Their scenarios are always good and I ought to know. Because time is their editor. I'd be very honored if you'd join me again in exactly 10,050 minutes time. Or, if you prefer it, in exactly 167.5 hours time. When I'll be here to tell you another of my stories. Until then, I wish you all happy time. The clock will be heard next week in exactly 10,050 minutes' time from this same station. Written by Lawrence Clee with Hart McGuire as narrator, you heard Charles Tingwell as Howard Williams and Ken Wayne as Mallory. Others in the cast were Wendy Playfair, Joe McCormick, Don Crosby, and June Salter. The clock, directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production. <laughs> <laughs>